this lecture, we're going to talk about a concept called the tragedy of the commons. This concept, the concept of the tragedy of the commons, has been developed following the introduction of a paper in which the idea was um, initially conceived uh, in 1968 in the journal Science. And there's a picture of the um, cover here. And you can download it on the internet if you'd like to. Um, it's a very gr good article introducing this idea. Uh, the article was written by Garrett Hardin, and it was about discussing primarily economic problems that arise from things that are commons. The author was particularly interested in applying uh, different kinds of solutions and analytical approaches to limiting population growth, but this concept has now been applied as an analytical tool for a wide range of other problems and has provided some understandability, particularly um, towards trying to understand sustainability challenges. So this article starts with an interesting observation um, from the Cold War, a time when the United States and the Soviet Union primarily uh, were at odds with one another and were uh, building nuclear stockpiles in an effort to deter one another um, from, from war. So as the U.S. and the former Soviet Union stockpiled nuclear arms, they were steadily increasing their military power, but at the same time, because of the amount of destruction that was enabled by these weapons, they were gradually eroding their national security simultaneously. So through this example, Hardin drew attention to the fact that this problem really doesn't have a technological solution. It required a change in human values or a change in the ideas of morality in order to stop this ever-growing increase in nuclear weapons. So that this problem in particular reminds me of our previous discussion during this class when we were talking about the narratives of technological determinism. Using that concept, we're led to conclude that technological solutions are always welcome because of their technology, and they, they're new, and they appear to be the future and necessarily appear to be better, because that's kind of the, the, the culture in which we live. But we can see that in the case of nuclear arms, as one example, the bigger picture was not getting better, and that should serve as a warning sign about other places where we just casually accept the idea that technological solutions are going to make things better. So the tragedy of the commons expands on this example of the nuclear arms race to create a whole class of problems where a similar structure exists. So another example would be the, the game of tic-tac-toe, just the very basic game of tic-tac-toe. If you study this problem, if you study this game for a little while, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't take a lot of um, deep insight to understand that two sufficiently skilled players can create an environment where no one can ever win the game. So in order to win tic-tac-toe, it really requires redefining what win means in order to make any progress or drastically changing the rules of the game. For example, if you uh, club your opponent over the head with some big stick and knock them unconscious, and that counts as a win, you fundamentally change the rules of the game so that the original analysis didn't work. So tic-tac-toe is an example of a situation where people can't win, uh, and therefore you need a change in understanding about what winning means in order to make any sort of progress in the game. So, his overall purpose of his argument just personally makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm a, I'm a father of four kids, so I have a pretty large family, and he was basically arguing that human population growth is in this class of problems. And, and, and you know, in a lot of ways, we can trace back many sustainability problems to the fact that the world's population is increasing to a point at which the planet can't sustain um, that population anymore. And so the basic premise that he says is that the world is finite, limited resources, and therefore can only support a finite population. And so that means that at some point, population growth must reach zero. So there is some maximum population that's theoretically possible, but if we ever reached that, there'd be no margin for doing anything beyond merely sustaining our existence. There'd be no vacations, there'd be no movies, there'd be no sports, because every free moment, every calorie that you spent in moving your body and doing work would have to be spent on collecting, raising, growing the next calorie just so that you could sustain the population. There'd be no energy left over to do anything vaguely cultural. So then we're faced with this very difficult question. At what population should we stop and how are we going to do that? So a common response to this would be to rely on market-based solutions. A market-based solution would argue that individuals left to their own devices will stop having children because they see that they're worse off at some point 
with more children than they are with their current number of children. So proponents of the market-based position argue quite strongly and well-formulated argument that because everyone values different things in life differently, some people value children more than they value vacations, we should just let everyone make up their own individual choice and this will end up being best for everyone. So in order to counter the market argument, Hardin introduced the idea of the tragedy of the commons. So in this case, when he says the word tragedy, he doesn't mean just the common meaning of the word, something sad, but he means rather the dramatic or the philosophical use of the word, which means that the essence of tragedy isn't unhappiness, but it resides in the solemnity of the remorseless working of things. So he then referred back to a pamphlet from the 1700s in which this tragedy of the commons idea was introduced in the context of a shepherd and a pasture. So imagine or picture an open pasture that's open to everyone. Each shepherd in that village that uses that pasture grazes a flock of sheep there in common and everyone uses the pasture as a commons. So let's say that there are 500 sheep per shepherd. It's a very large commons and that there are 20 shepherds. So one day in a period of relative stability, each shepherd starts to think about how they can maximize their own profit. They think, well, what's the benefit to me of getting one more sheep? Well, it's pretty good. I get one more sheep. And what's the cost of that? Well, the cost to, to me is very small. There's a small cost to the commons, and that cost is the pasture lost by introducing one more sheep into the pasture. And it's very small because it's the difference between each sheep getting one ten thousandth of the pasture and a sheep getting one ten thousand and one-th of the pasture because the pasture is shared. So overall, it's a real good decision for me. Adding together the benefits and the cost, yeah, I'm going to get another sheep. So this herdsman gets another sheep and then does the calculation again and continues adding more and more and more sheep. Well, of course, at the same time, all the other shepherds, all the other herdsmen are reaching the same conclusion. And so each individual is reaping the full benefit of having another sheep, but the costs are being borne by the whole community. And that's the tragedy, of course. It's, it's a tragedy because each shepherd is locked into a market-based system in which the choices that they make in order to individually benefit themselves are destroying the very system that they depend on, which is a commons. And so the quote from the, the article is that, a fr that freedom in a commons brings ruin to all because you get locked into this market-based behavior. So education. Education can counteract this natural tendency to some degree. If you understand what you're doing, you may resist some of the ten temptation to buy another sheep. But this puts people in a state of cognitive dissonance because they're required to continually convince themselves not to take an action which would benefit themselves when they look out and they possibly see other people walk around them taking the exact same action to their benefit, leaving um, the individual behind. And so that's a very difficult uh, position to put people in and to expect them to be able to behave um, in a way that's good for the commons. The structure of this argument generally has been applied to it as an analytical tool to a number of different environmental sustainability challenges. Take, for example, the issue of ocean fishing. So the oceans is a commons, and each company or person or government may think that adding one more fishing boat, one more fishing pole, one more fishing fleet is going to be better for them, and they're right. You know, they get, uh, they get additional fish as part of their harvest. But eventually, there just won't be enough fish left in the ocean in order to feed anyone. Another example is pollution. You can think of the air, the atmosphere as a commons. Each individual polluter thinks that increasing their manufacturing activity or whatever activity they're doing that increases pollution isn't individually going to cause any substantial harm. And they're right. You know, a little additional pollution uh, put into the whole atmosphere by an individual isn't very much cost compared to the benefit of the additional manufacturing activity. But pretty soon if everyone does that, um, places like Beijing become so badly polluted that you can barely see um, any considerable distance on many days during the year. A third example is peak oil. Peak oil is an example where any individual drilling for a new barrel of oil uh, reaps the benefit of that barrel of oil, but at the same time is depleting the commons of the oil that's available, generally speaking, everywhere um, that isn't renewable. And so you get the benefit of one oil, but overall one barrel of oil, but overall the amount of oil that's available goes away. These are some sustainability examples, but there are examples also that are specifically in the technological realm. For example, net neutrality. 
If you as an individual consumer turn on Netflix and say, oh, I'd like to download one additional movie and maybe at one slightly higher quality level, well, that's good for you. You get a better movie experience. Um, you know, you paid for it basically. Um, but pretty soon if everyone does this, you're going to saturate the bandwidth of the wires that bring those bits to your house or the wireless spectrum that bring those bits to your house and no one's going to be able to watch a movie because of the congestion. Another example is spam email. Because spam is um, basically free to send, any additional email that gets sent by a sender gives them some benefit. It, 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 increased exposure, better marketing. But um, because it's very cheap, the sender can receive many, many emails and um, that's not good for the sender as they receive all of these things. So the sender is kind of the commons in that example, or the receiver is kind of the commons in that example, who receives many emails from many senders and it destroys your information, your ability to process information. As well, the backbone on which email travels gets saturated by all these emails. So the backbone is a commons and the attention span of a receiver is a commons. Um, yep, yeah, so those are two technological examples.